It's very interesting because as another philosophy and political science student, actually many of the reasons why I got involved in the technological singularity in general and in starting singularityweblog.com in particular were asking those big questions that you're asking. So that's why perhaps I enjoyed your book so much. But let me just give you an example, a very recent example that kind of um, brings forth to me what we're coming up against, what kind of mental attitude people have. So, for example, um, yesterday one of my wife's best friend was getting married, so we were at the wedding party, but the night before was the rehearsal dinner. And after the rehearsal dinner, we were chatting uh, at the dinner table with a bunch of the closest friends of her friend's family, and there was this gentleman who is a marine biologist uh, by trade, um, I think uh, from the University of Michigan, and he made a statement something like, first of all, um, working on longevity and life extension technology is a waste of time and money. But secondly, people who work in that field should be shot. <laughs> oh, well, that's quite a strong statement, isn't it? Yes, and, and I was, at first I just could not, I, I could not connect the dots because he did not strike me as somebody very extreme in any way. He's a scientist by trade, a marine biologist, and then he comes up with a statement like that, that anyone who works on longevity is not only wasting resources, but it's so much so that they should be shot. <laughs> so have you, have you encountered attitudes like that somewhere? And what do we do to change them? I have not encountered that quite that extreme of an argument, but um, <laughs> I have encountered many people who say, who are nervous about the idea of living longer and healthier lives uh, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, usually the the most popular reason, uh, the, the frequently cited reason uh, that I hear when I'm going around talking about this book is, oh, well, you know, if people didn't die at the same rate as they die now, the earth would become overpopulated. And, you know, what would we do? I mean, this would be a huge crisis. We don't have enough resources for everyone, and uh, and don't we have enough people already? And so that's that's one of the arguments, which, of course, I, I counter in the book. I don't think that's true at all um, for various different reasons. I mean, on the, on the population, uh, just on the on the growth numbers uh, issue, world population growth rates are actually declining. And there's a chart in my book where you can see it's going down uh, like that, and fertility rates are declining. By 2050, the U.N., predicts that uh, we won't even be replacing ourselves anymore. Fertility rates will be below uh, 2.1, which is what you need for replacement values. Um, but not only that, I mean, there's it's not just the population question. There's also the question of how do we keep the world clean, right? And you know from being at Singularity University that there's all these technologies in development, like synthetic biology and, and, and nanotechnology, that are going to allow us to keep the environment in even better shape than it is today. So there's a, there's many different ways to uh, to come back to that question, but so so that that's one of the one of the knee jerk reactions I typically typically get. Um, it sounds like maybe the person you were talking to just has an ethical uh, objection to it, like you know it's just not natural. Humans shouldn't live longer than eighty years. Yeah, uh, we we did uh, discuss many of those issues and the Malthusian argument he made it that the overpopulation Malthusian argument he made and I kind of utilized many of the arguments in your book oh, to kind of argue back to him and and we I think I managed to knock them off one by one but the very last thing that remained in the end was that thing which you also also mentioned in the book and that's the sort of Oscar Wildean uh, sort of Dorian Gray syndrome or perception that, that, you know, if you defeat death, you're kind of making a Faustian deal of a sort, and, and that, in a way, immortality, if, if we can reach that, would be a curse, would not be a blessing. So right. how do we combat, and that's where I failed uh, in, in my argument, how do we engage at that level, I wonder, or convince the other side that it's worthwhile? Well, I think, I think it's difficult, uh, because throughout history, I mean, death has been part of humanity forever, really, uh, since the very beginning of time. And because, and, and because it causes so much anxiety, uh, we've come up with different stories to convince ourselves that it's not so bad. And in fact, if we didn't die, everything would be terrible. And it, we come up with all these psychological coping mechanisms to, con to convince ourselves that death is good. And we've been doing that for a really long time. 
And so when we're steeped in that culture, it's difficult, I think, for some people to break free of that and to, to look beyond that and say, no, you know what? We just told ourselves these stories because there, because there was never any chance that we could ever break free of our constraints. But now we're at a point in history that we actually have a chance. We have a chance where we can break free. We know that aging is plastic. We can see from, from the work of all these scientists that it might actually might be possible not only to repair ourselves uh, using our own stem cells, but to maybe even slow down aging. And, uh, and I think, so I think it's, it's not easy to counter uh, the cultural objection because it's so deeply ingrained. Uh, maybe the first step to doing that is to just point it out. You know, like, we don't have to turn into vampires to live longer. You don't have to suck people's blood, right? I mean, we've made up those stories that, you know, like, oh, well, we could live longer, but then we'd just be evil. No, we can live longer and we don't have to be evil. And that's, that's the new paradigm. And so getting, getting people there, I think, is tough, as you point out. So is that the goal behind your, your book in a way to change that cultural in perception, uh, that cultural perception, that sort of knee-jerk reaction of people to immediately sort of pull back and, and try and resist it? Absolutely. That was one of the big reasons why I wrote the book. To, to first inform people that all of this stuff is even happening. Because honestly, if you're a busy professional, you're a busy person, you might not have time to be reading the science news. I mean, maybe you see, you know, the Wall Street Journal. I love that newspaper because they really report on all the big advancements. I mean, a, a few weeks ago when uh, a brand new uh, windpipe was grown for a man who was living in Iceland uh, because he had cancer, they made a, they did a 3D scan, uh, created a uh, brand new windpipe for him, seeded it with his own stem cells, took out his diseased cancerous windpipe, put in the new one, They and he's completely completely cured. I mean, we grew a brand new organ for this guy, we repaired him, and now he has an entire lifetime left. And that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But, you know, it's like you read it, you put, you're like, wow, that's amazing. You put it down, and you might forget about it. And there's many, many of those stories that build up over time. And, and so I wanted to have it all in one place so people could look at it and go, wow, when you take a look at all of these advances together, it's very clear that we're going to be able to repair humans really, really well in the future and extend our life and health expectancy. Uh, and then once you realize that, that forces a change in paradigm, right? I mean, it forces you to sort of think, sit back and go, wow, okay, things are going to change. And so, and so I think, I also think that it's time that we start thinking about those things so that we're not caught off guard and, you know, like one day where we just wake up and go, oh my God, things have really changed, right? I mean, I, I think we need, we need to get ready for it. So, um, let me ask you this then. Um, perhaps the toughest, uh, dimension of, of culture is religion. Uh, the, the, the deepest embedded, the most ingrained in, into, uh, of psyche, or, uh, what do you think? So first, let me, let me backtrack and, and ask you, are you religious yourself? In any way? Oh, well, I, I consider myself agnostic. I'm not, uh, I'm not part of any type of organized religion, but I'm not, uh, I, I wouldn't rule out the idea of God. So, uh, so I'm, guess, I guess, a little bit in the middle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm always surprised by the answer I get from the people I interview. So it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, okay, and, and then taking it to the general picture, how do you think that all those changes in, in uh, growing artificial organs and life extension beyond 100 or 150 or even more years would impact the, the, the major religions of the world? Right. So this was the most fascinating chapter of the book for me to write because it was so surprising. You know, I started out with the premise that uh, as we move further and further away from death, we'll become less religious because the afterlife might, you know, it won't be in our uh, top of mind anymore. We won't be seeing people die like quite so often. So we, we won't be thinking about the afterlife so much. So maybe that will reduce the role of religion in our lives. And uh, when I started digging into the data and talking with religious scholars and, and looking at like what happened last time when we extended life expectancy from 43 to 80. Uh, and it turns out that that's not the case at all. 
And in fact, it turns out it's not the case that we become more scientific. We become less religious, which has just absolutely floored me. That shocked me. I mean, I, I, in fact, I didn't even believe it. Uh, so that chapter actually took me much longer to write because I just didn't believe what I was finding. Uh, I went everywhere. I talked to everyone. I, you know, it's like I'm calling the people at the, the Pew Foundation as a huge uh, research division on religion. I talked to them many, many times and, and read a lot of their work. And uh, it turns out that w humans over time have had a really constant rate of about 90% of the world is religious, and it kind of just stays there. The only time it ever dipped was uh, during uh, the, the reign of communism, when uh, the communists absolutely outlawed religion, and then it went down to 70%. The world was only 70% religious at that time, and then as communism started to fall, it went right back up. And, you know, there's a few different theories for why that happens. You know, there's, there's the biological theory that, well, we're just wired for God. We're wired for spirituality. Our brain just works that way, and we evolve that way. Uh, and then there's other sort of philosophical explanations for it uh, in terms of it being, you know, important to our psyche. And, 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 um, and, and one of the things I didn't realize, I think, when I started out uh, writing that chapter was the other, because, because I'm not part of an organized religion, I think, maybe, uh, was that there's something else to religion besides the afterlife. I mean, it's not just about the afterlife, right? It's not just about heaven and hell. It's also about how do you live your life, right? And what is the purpose of life? I mean, religion really spends a lot of time, most religions, focusing on the purpose. Why are we here? What is good, right? What is good? What is bad? How should you, what is the good life? How do you live your life? And, you know, it turns out that in maybe as we live longer and we have more life, more time where we need guidance in terms of our purpose, Religion could actually potentially become even more important to us as as a guiding factor. So, uh, but but that said, I think religions will have to evolve. Uh, you know, th those that focus too much on the afterlife will eventually become extinct, and other ones will come in to take their place. So, I mean, I think the the religious marketplace, if you will, is an evolving area, and uh, and I think religions will have to change in response to life extension technologies, but they won't go away. We won't see a world with no religion because of science. That's not going to happen. You see, that was one of the most profound sort of things that I would take away from your book, I think, because me, I'm, I'm personally an atheist, and, you know, just like uh, you, in the sense, I had this predisposition to believe that as uh, those advanced technologies get more and more into the mainstream and people live longer and longer and we start taking them for granted, religion would kind of sort of wane away slowly until it disappears completely. But I think you managed to convince me otherwise here in, in your book and, and that's perhaps the biggest thing that I'll be taking away that in fact it can coexist with technology which is kind of very interesting and paradoxical to me. It's yes. a counterintuitive, at least to my intuition, counterintuitive um, uh, outcome. <laughs> yeah, me too. That it really, I spent so much time doing research for that chapter. Let me tell you.